my attention, learning and neuroplasticity are very closely related. Our brain develops plasticity for learning when it finds optimal conditions. We are attentive to something because it is important for us and we assume we can accomplish the task. So let's take a look at the agenda. Today, at first, I will briefly explain attention and then neuroplasticity. And then we'll focus on the connection between attention and neuroplasticity. And then I would like to give some hints on attracting attention in learning context. Attention. Attention is often referred to a selective attention in contrast to general state of arousal, which is non-specific. Selective attention is the ability to focus on a particular aspect of sensory input. Selective attention allows us to preferently process some of the information coming at us and ignore the rest as Beer, Connors and Paradiso define. In the resting state, areas in the brain that are referred to as the default mode network, resting state network, are active. They include the medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. This network is more active in the resting state than during active tasks. When the mode of attention changes from the resting state to the attentional state, Activity in the default mode network decreases and increases in those networks needed for the specific activity, for example, visual or auditory. This activity relates to either perceptual involving perception or sensory tasks. Two forms of attention are distinguished, exogenous and endogenous attention. Exogenous attention is attention aroused by external stimuli. For example, striking coloration, lighting reflexes, or movement that attract our attention. Endogenous attention directs attention from the brain consistently to an object or place to specifically serve a behavior, as Biaconis Paradiso mentioned. Neuroplasticity. Our brain adapts throughout our life to the experience we have. It thus responds to challenges and prepares us for similar subsequent challenges. Plasticity is highest in early childhood, but persists into old age. Genetic predisposition forms the starting point, but how strongly and extensively the genes are activated depends on other factors such as experiences and low stimulus or high stimulus environment of a person. Functional plasticity alters the efficiency of synaptic transmissions by remodeling or building receptors. According to speed of synaptic transmissions is altered. Structural plasticity, on the other hand, changes the brain anatomically. Dendrites, accents, and myelinations change the density and the volume of the great and why matter. The thickness of the cortex or the shape of the jury, as Jenica says, and not only demonstrably in musicians or athletes, but in every human being, because learning induces such plastic processes throughout our life. Connection between attention and neuroplasticity. By increasing attention, other perceptions are limited. Increasing speed and precision of processing. 
So we can do things faster and more precisely when we are attentive. Attention increases arousal and strengthens memory, making it an important key to neuroplasticity. Judy Willis suggests that attention is a basic condition of learning. It is important to keep students interested so that the gatekeeper of the RRS remains open and learning can be reflected through the limbic system in the prefrontal cortex. Acetylcholine plays a central role in these processes. The most important neurotransmitters and hormones are serotonin for satisfaction, dopamine for excitement, reward effects, adrenaline, mobilizes energy reserves during stress, noradrenaline increases attention or alertness, melatonin regulates sleep-wake rhythm, and acetylcholine facilitates learning and memory formation. That's nicht emphasizes that acetylcholine is released when you're engaged in a behavior or when a brain is delivered a novel stimulus. With this release, the filter of possible alternative inputs is open for up to several minutes. As Merzig points on. The brain is thus activated and plastic processes are enabled for the next few minutes. In addition, novel stimulus activate the production of noradrenaline, which increases positive arousal levels. Mertzenich found in his own research that when something was really important to the experimental animals, large changes occurred in their brains, while when something was irrelevant, no change occurred. Also, the strength of the effort was crucial for neuroplasticity. The harder and more concentrated the animal had to work on a task, the stronger the neural effects. What can we do to arouse attention? From what has been said, there are three primary consequences. The learning content should attract attention. The attention should be maintained in the learning process by relevance and by the task which should not be too easy. And attention can be attracted by external stimuli or by conscious internal fixation on the task. Both can be supported by the teacher. Regarding exogenous attention, Judy Willis cites numerous ways to attract and maintain attention in the class, such as video, video clips, music, movement, changes in tone and volume, and so on. She says that the RRS can be influenced by novelty, curiosity, surprise, the unexpected, and change. I wondered how suspense is created in other fields and found some methods authors use to get readers interested in the book in the first few pages and keep them hooked through the text. In my opinion, some of these methods are very transferable to the classroom. First of all, good authors engage their readers by drawing attention to the future and create suspense through the implied future event. Something exciting will happen in the future. Sentences like, if I had known what was coming, my blood would have frozen in my veins. Put readers in suspense until they know what is in store for the narrator. For example, the teacher might say at the beginning of the lesson that the students will wonder what the solution is at the end of the lessons or something similar. I sometimes start my lesson by saying, today I brought you something exciting. Until recently a student replied, oh, you say that every time. Secondly, exciting texts often work with a mystery. The mysterious not knowing magically attracts, as Millipond does. An unread letter 
an unknowing enemy, a box, phrase, or word. You may be familiar with the movie Citizen Kane, in which a reporter searches for the meaning of the media mod module's last word, Rosebud, a suspenseful movie. In a book or movie, before the mystery is revealed, a second mystery is often introduced to keep the suspense high and the reader hooked. For example, we might imagine a history lesson that begins with a person's diary entry and students gradually find out what became of the writer during the revolution. Thirdly, action creates suspense. In books and movies, this often means lots of action against time. Thus, action can likewise be generated in class through time pressure. For example, today we are trying to finish reading the whole book, or we are now filling in this table very quickly. Come on, by 9.30 we will be done, and so on. Or alternating with quiet phrases can also balance the tension curve. However, it threatens to become boring, teachers need a change of tension. As a change of methods, a change of pace, or as tension between different positions. And to come to the last point, the extraordinary always attracts attention, while the average tends to cause boredom. Wide ideas, suggestions, superpowers, great joy or tragedies, entering the classroom sing singing or standing on the table and shouting carpe diem. Unusual objects, subjects, actions and events can be well incorporated into the, into the lesson. The extraordinary attracts attention. Teachers who are brave and not afraid to make fools of themselves, certainly have an average here. Accordingly, suspense generates attention, and suspense means raising questions that students want answered. In addition, we can support students' indigenous attention by teaching them to turn off all distracting external stimuli to become fully engaged in one thing, first for short periods of time and then for longer and longer periods, and thus to focus attentively. Summary. Attention, learning, and neuroplasticity are very closely related as attention opens the RRS through acetylcholine allowing learning and neuroplasticity processes to occur. We can support exogenous as well as endogenous attention in our learners through targeted interventions. In particular, lying lessons with future events, shrouding the content as a mystery, action-rich periods, and incorporating the extraordinary are all means of generating exogenous attention. Endogenous attention could be taught to students in focusing exercises. Thank you. Bye.